Okay. Okay. Hi guys. Uh, my name's uh, Leland Flynn. I'm a board member of the Dallas Makerspace. Uh, we've got a great guest here today. Uh, his name is uh, Marcin uh, Jakubowski. Jakubowski. Uh, here from Open Source Ecology. Uh, he uh, he created the uh, Global Village Construction Set, and uh, he's going to talk to us a little bit about it. And um, hopefully, we'll figure out uh, what project we might all want to work on and uh, help them uh, develop. Okay. <laughs> okay, my name is Marcin, founder of Open Source Ecology, and started this about five years ago, basically finishing the grad school and, and having to do a little mid-course correction as I felt I was getting more useless in the, in the program that I was studying and all that. So I said, okay, if you want to start to reinvent civilization, start with land, get, get back to land, and find all the difficulties with that. And one of the main things that influenced the work <coughs> was, of course, the equipment, which is missing or, like, there's not a lot of sustainable or ecologically friendly equipment that you can s do a, an operation that includes agriculture production and all of that. So that, that's definitely a thread underneath that. So who's here? Who's seen the TED Talk here? Yeah. A, lot of, a lot of you guys. Yeah, so I would recommend, uh, <coughs> let's see, we just published basically all the results to date, which is the tractors, the, the compressed earth brick press, soil pulverizer, the hydraulic power <coughs> unit. That was basically published December. We're sending out, print out a, a real DVD of that. We're calling it the Civilization Starter Kit DVD version 0.01. Mm -hmm. It's literally, we're like a hundred <laughs> of a way there. It's <laughs> really where we're at. So yeah, that brings up um, where we're at right now. I mean, the goals are pretty ambitious. Um, we've, uh, the TED talk last year that I gave that put us really on a, on a world map, there was lots of interest in all that. Right now, in the last two months, we actually, or today, we've got like like half a million bucks to work with. Um, I'm not supposed to say that yet, but I became a <laughs> Shuttleworth <laughs> fellow, actually. Oh. So that's that's news. I think that's supposed to be public knowledge by now, I think. But <laughs> okay. Um, so there's resources to work with, but but the thing is, it's we're in, in total development. It's like there's people already starting to say, okay, well, how do we build a community with that? Well, let's build the tools first. That's always that's always what I say. There's efforts in the in Europe starting OSE Europe. They're they're actually looking at land and, and trying to replicate operations and so forth. There's been three independent operations so far. So Tom is one of them. He's built a power cube, which I'm going to check out and look forward to doing that. Uh, this compressed earth brick press has been replicated by James Slade in Texas. And what was the third one? There's there's another guy working on the power cube, and what's his status right, right now? And Andrew Spina, and yeah, and he's uh, he's begun fabrication of it. He's uh, doing the hydraulic tank, and yeah. Anyway, it's in the works. Yeah, and another guy uh, actually built some of the parts of the CNC torch table. So, and <coughs> one of the reasons why I'm down here in Texas is there's a guy who lives close to James Slade who also built a torch table, which is actually well worked out, has hundreds of hours of use in, in real production. So we're actually going to get him to to build one for us and then we're going to open source that fully and it will be a combination of router and torch table because it's sturdy enough. Hmm. Um, but let's see, so yeah, I didn't really prepare anything in particular for this, so, <coughs> so maybe let's, let's talk about uh, what you guys are interested in and, and all the technologies that, that we're working on right now. And, and the priorities are for us, a lot of times we, we do it in a bootstrapping fashion, like like we needed a tractor because ours kept breaking uh, for agriculture and for moving things around. Mm -hmm. We needed the earth brick press because we want we, the first thing you go <laughs> onto land is you need some housing. So we're actually building a 4,000 square foot workshop right now and a 10 living unit, 3,000 square foot facility out of the compressed earth bricks. And we're doing double walls where you have layer of compressed earth brick stick straw bale insulation between and another layer so you get literally super insulated housing at the cost of dirt and straw where the straw we also picked off our own land so trying to experiment all the all the different <coughs> ways you can use local resources and we are actually getting the sawmill finished the dimensional sawmill like a 54 horsepower <coughs> device that we can now add lumber to the whole operation so that is that is an immediate thing that will will be coming forth Right now, the tractor is at the state of um, just last night. I was working late, but 
We got it to lift 3,000 pound pallets, so we put more weight on the back. The weight distribution was kind of bad, because it's altogether pretty light. It's like a 3,000 pound tractor. So weighing it down, yeah, we're getting to lift 3,000 pound pallets of bricks, because we got to move all the bricks from where we were pressing to into the place. And that's that's on the ground right now. We're right now, Brianna is working on a on a 120 ton uh, iron worker machine, which is a device like st like the heart of uh, any custom fabrication, which allows you to shear up to one inch by 12 inch metal slabs. You know, so you can punch holes, shear metal, shear angles, and things like that. That's <coughs> another project. <coughs> Back at Factory Farm, we've got Yunso working on a CNC circuit mill. That's uh, a small, highly modular. Yeah, a lot of people have made these. We're trying to really make one that's super replicable, really designed for fabrication. That that the whole tool chain is worked out on that, and we need that to m to mill our own controllers for the compressed earth brick press. Mm -hmm. That machine is totally automated, and right now we're just buying the controllers. We've simplified the electronics, and now we want to actually mill our own mill our own little cir controller circuit. So just start with an Arduino, and then and go to the our solen uh, what do you call it solenoid driver. Yeah, that does that. Um, what else is going on right now? We're we're tooling up right now as we got the workshop up. We're gonna get some mills, a surface grinder, and another lathe, and and we are working on a precision multi machine. So <coughs> we're trying to design that as a totally modular construction set. Like the theme that goes under a, a lot of our work is construction set, like a Lego set of construction, which we've demonstrated a lot with the tractor. And the major milestone, like just to go, go into the modularity aspect, <coughs> the major milestone right there, we built, if you, if you look at the blog, uh, we built quick attach motors for the tractor. So you pull one le cam lever and two bolts and cool. you can take the wheels right off. <laughs> so that's, I mean, no one's done this. No. <laughs> but it's really cool because that <coughs> allows you uh, to modularize the whole structure in an incredible way. So you can use those same wheels on maybe a little tractor or even a bigger tractor or whatever. Um, so, so in the tractor, as an example, the, the frame is highly modular, made of box beam tubing. Power units are dismountable, parts interchange, and the wheels interchange. So that's, that's big steps. So taking that to the multi-machine, we want to a precision machining device. We want to basically design a system where, where the same kind of axis would be the basic same design would apply to X, Y, and Z, and it would be scalable. So you, you make some module, maybe nine by eighteen inches module. Then you can stack them <coughs> to each other to to basically make a long lathe bed or a vertical mill or whatever, and then add CNC controls, add rotary indexing to that to get that that side of the job done and and mount it to concrete bases. So it's like you can have a big concrete block. That's that's horizontal or vertical. Uh, so once again, the construction set. Can we can we set a new standard for for DIY production of precision machinery? So that's that's not an easy problem, but uh, it's doable. It's definitely doable. And if you design it with the the construction <coughs> set in mind, that could be really powerful. And we always go after economic significance. This is not about toys. Uh, this is about a real equipment that that provides the economy of of. <coughs> of the future is the industry 2.0 concept downloadable downloadable design <laughs> made locally awesome. with global collaboration that's that's a concept whose time has come so there's the multi machine <coughs> the next part by this year we want to actually <coughs> start <coughs> start melting the metal that we can roll hot roll to make the steel for all our things <coughs> so that's that's a huge step that involves power electronics that's an induction furnace power supply right there Right now, we're basically buying parts off shelf. You know, start with that, and then you do the technological recursion. You start making the components. So with a precision machine, you can make the components down to hydraulic motors for the tractor, down to modern steam engines that power the tractor, from pelletized biomass with the with a pelletizer burned that that provides you modern power. Modern steam engines, actually, if anyone has seen. For example, the, the Cyclone steam engine that's actually been made more efficient than internal combustion gasoline engines by recycling a lot of the heat, mm -hmm. running super critical, no oil. I mean, so so that's that's part of the technology we want to develop as well. Modern steam en engine version, you can run it off pellets, off, off the straw bales that we collect <coughs> and pelletize, <coughs> have, have power from that. 
Um, power, so power electronics, we, we also want to take a look at power electronics as a construction set. So, so basically design modules that plug into each other. You know, you'll have your inverter module, which, whichever frequency module. So basically put in any voltage and frequency in and get any voltage frequency out. That covers induction furnace power supplies, inverters, uh, plasma cutter power supplies, welder power supplies, just about everything. So we want to build that whole infrastructure of the, the micro factory the, in a really, once again, a modular fashion so that someone who doesn't <coughs> have, you know, it just really you're about reducing the barriers to entry on this. Just if you have modules that you can understand what their function is, you can start playing with them and make really powerful equipment. And so they would have to be designed in a scalable fashion. Um, so you can stack one or more of them and get the power you want. Like right now, we're actually off grid right now, so we've been running a generator, we've got some solar panels and all that, um, but right now we're actually getting, as an intermediate step, we're getting a big set of, actually two big forklift batteries, which weigh a total of 4,400 pounds, and using stackable inverters. So we're gonna get five little inverters, 2.5 kilowatts each, and we're gonna run our welders off of that. So we can run one or two welders just by trickle charging that battery and and <laughs> instead of running the the generator i mean that's it's a pto generator it's it's dangerous it's got a spinning part they want to get wrapped <laughs> up in it so for safety that's part of the reason you go solid state with a big battery bank yeah. and then the next step after that is is build nickel iron batteries those are the edison batteries i don't know if anybody's heard of them but yeah, i've read about them they are batteries that when Edison made them at the turn of the century, there's ones that are 80 years later working as well as new. So this is like the only sustainable battery technology that's out there, nickel and iron <coughs> essentially. And that's, so that's also one of the technologies. Um, what else do we have? So, so there's the whole power electronics side, precision machining, there's the solar concentrator side. But I think, I don't know, it seems like a lot of talent here might be in, in the power electronics. I mean, we're just getting started on that, but that's, um, maybe we can talk about that. So that's the basic status at present. The, the main projects right now, so we're wrapping up the tractor with the, the detachable wheel motors, and we bent the loader arm so that the weight balance is better. Um, the three other projects, the power cube, it's in pretty good shape. The pulverizer is pretty much ready. The CEB is pretty much ready. And we're gonna, basically, uh, we're throwing that out to the community so that the improvements could now start coming back in as people start using them, different modifications all put into are all put into the open source. Okay, so there's the CNC circuit mill, iron worker, uh, dimensional sawmill. What else did I miss? Um, actually, there's a guy designing the, the very efficient gasifier burner. Those are the present projects right now. Pelletizer. Here. Say that again? The pelletizer. Pelletizer, that's, that's a pretty high priority. We don't have anyone explicitly working on that, but that's, <coughs> that's definitely a high priority to get our own pellets for the modern steam engine. We are working on a, <coughs> on a heat exchange coils for the for the steam engine. That's that's another one. Um, altogether, there's uh, all the different tools that I mean. There's a lot of agriculture tools, well drilling rig included, all that. There's there's the construction tools, which kind of double up as agriculture tools. There's the power electronics, power infrastructure. Now those are kind of the main categories. But we should talk maybe maybe open it up to questions or or how do we how do we, I mean, let's pick a project, like, I would suggest something like the inverter or induction furnace to melt metal. I think the induction furnace would be something you guys would be totally interested in to melt, <coughs> start melting things, re reclaiming iron from the scrap stream, bringing <coughs> production back to America. I mean, that's, that's the ultimate goal. It's like we have the power to use that technology locally in a different way. <laughs> so. So on the wiki, does it, is there a tracking <coughs> Obviously, you're tracking what you're working on on the farm, yeah. but in the password didn't change. And are people, yeah. other people tracking? Like, here's what we're working on, or, or yeah. I mean, that the wiki is pretty wild right now. We don't have a really good way to to track things. We, we still need a, a much better platform. Right now, our repository of design is the Open Pario site, so all the final design is is put up there. But yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a big issue too to to get the infrastructure up truly, truly to make collaboration better. We did start GrabCAD. Have you guys heard about GrabCAD? That's a crowd design platform where people, there's a bounty and people do crowd design and you, you select a winner. So basically, 
when you put up a challenge up there, you get the benefit of all the different contributions, as opposed to like a bidding site. Uh, you, all the input comes in and it's it's shared openly. So there's there's this platform called GrabCAD for that. We just put up the live track wheel, the quick connect wheels on that. Got some good ideas. We actually went with a very simple design that we had from before, and it's it's working quite well. Um, so that's I mean there's that I mean Kickstarter can be used for kicking off a bunch of different projects. There's a lot of different ways, but it's <coughs> once again it's about people, uh, dedicated developers to do that. We ha we have people on site through dedicated project visits. That's a really effective way. Like Tom came for a month or so, and he was working on the power cube and the other things. So, um, and remote collaboration. People are welcome to work on the wiki, but there's a lot that could be done to define a good open hardware development platform. Would be like ten PhDs. <laughs> you know, it's mm -hmm. like that's a that's a big big issue because you're now including the physical production plant on top of just plain collaboration which has real costs, real constraints there. Yeah. So, so how do you get, um, I mean, okay, so you, you yep. leave university, you get a PhD, you yeah. go to a farm, and that part yeah. needs a little more explanation, but um, how do you get from there to having a set of 50 machines that's, that's well thought out and you know, yeah. kind of ordered, if I had one of these, I could make this. Yeah. There's a lot of industrial knowledge in there, yeah. and it's kind of interesting just looking at it from the outside, how, how mm -hmm. do you get there? How do you get there? As in yeah. someone starting <coughs> well, how to re get a replication, or just to how develop did you get them? The, the idea of the fifty machines. Why yeah. these fifty machines? Who came okay. that? How did it develop? Basically, there. I wrote a proposal back in the something like two thousand six or something regarding and regarding this exact issue, and it's selected according to the product selection metric, which weighs first the economic significance. Is this an impor important tool? Okay, if you eat. You, you use a tractor, whether you know it or not, <laughs> for example. Right. Then you look at the access to that device. Is it expensive? So tractors are reasonably expensive. They break. They're designed for obsolescence. So yes, that's an important one. Then you scan all the different needs that a person has, food, housing, so forth, and select the, the ones that are most important economically, uh, pretty expensive, um, hard, to, you know, just hard to, like, really, if you may, inappropriate. Like, that's not the, the appropriate technology for that doesn't exist, if you may, um, and just go down the road. And basically, we scored it, saying, okay, um, I do encourage you to look at it. If you look at the, if you go to the wiki, go to the DVD actually. So that I actually mm -hmm. talk about. There's OSC specifications. <coughs> Um, an OSC product yeah. selection metric. You can read all about it. There's a few pages on that mm -hmm. where for each product we design it with a very particular set of properties. Namely, that it's economically significant, lifetime design, designed for disassembly, designed for fabrication, absolute simplicity, uh, basically the feature modularity, that's a huge one. If you go to the... Okay, go to... Go in the search box, DV, go to DVD version 0 0.01. So this is the actual table of contents that will be published on this DVD. But in it... Is it 0 0.01 or 0 0.0? 0.01. Yeah, so search for that. Um, DVD, just DVD V, just instead of version, go V0. Point, v no space. And it's impossible to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that there's a section, OSC specifications and the product selection metrics. It's in the introduction section, so you can, yeah, so do that um, here. Uh, these are good things, so, <coughs> hey, click on that. Can you purchase the DVD, or is it available to download? Or it's going to be available to download. Hey, play that. This is, a, this is where we're at. <laughs> <laughs> And it's really about beta release right now. This is really waiting for thousands of hours of use that makes it a makes it projects. Hi, my name is Marchin, founder of Open Source Ecology. Today, I'm proud to share the full documentation of the first four tools of the Global Village Construction Set, the Tools of Construction. Yeah. We're publishing all that you'll need to build yourself an automated compressed earth brick press, multi-purpose tractor, soil pulverizer, and hydraulic power unit. 
We're also including the initial field testing data of construction from 2011. Full plans are now complete and available for these four devices in their beta release stage <laughs> suggested for use by developers and makers. These now await the thousands of hours of field testing necessary for general adoption by the rest of the world. So please join us as early adopters and do your part in demonstrating the power of open source hardware. Let's build open source. Let's build civilization. So go back. This is actually there's some really cool videos here. Like uh, if you go to, so here you can read basically the the whole paradigm, what what we stand for, the rollout plan, and to discuss that right now we've got five hundred thousand in a bag, and we're aiming to do a rapid parallel deployment plan of all these technologies. And right now I'm thinking that the, the main thing that we need to do is, is we need help with recruiting the people who are going to be the prototypers, fabricators, mm -hmm. because it boils down to working with people that you can trust and, and that can deliver on time. An open source world is, is very well known for not delivering on time, mm -hmm. as we all know. <laughs> so, so it's a challenge. And, but the goal is very clear. By December 21st, which is the end of the world, or the my, Mayan calendar. Yes. By December 21, 2012, we aim to have all the prototypes done. That's pretty ambitious. That means a prototype every three days. That's that's crazy. It's a big, hairy, audacious goal indeed. Yeah. But with the resources that are coming in and there's no hint of them stopping, we think we're still going to do. And, and right now, it would take basically 12 projects at a time on a monthly prototyping scale, time scale, where each project goes through three prototypes before the beta release. So mm -hmm. that's the basic concept. And we do have a nonprofit sector branch. We do have a fiscal sponsor, so we do invite people to give donations. There's, there's been a bunch of unsolicited donations that came in uh, from various donors. People find out about us and they, they donate. And we did we did sell some product. We, we cleared twenty-five thousand dollars from pr from the production run where we sold the tractors and compressed earth brick presses. So that's Th that was my next question. Yeah. Um, is anybody using this to grow or raise something right now? Uh, it's early, and the tractor no, because right now we're just finishing the the issue about the the wheel motors. We had issues. That basically, it turned out that the motors we were using were simply not rated. They were actually mislabeled at surplus center because we're. <laughs> <laughs> We're buying a lot of stuff from Surplus Center, and there's limits to what you can do with that. But they were basically not rated for the pressure we were running, and, and they kept when on do breaking. They burn? Uh, the shaft ended up breaking. I mean, are, are they? Uh, oh yeah. So the power cubes build. I mean, right now the power cubes build just burn fuel, the gasoline, cool. and the, and the goal is as soon mm -hmm. as we get the modern steam engine up, we want to run it on pelletized biomass. So we are still hoping to do that by April of this year. You said the project's so already being helmed, though. The uh, the the steam engine. Uh, we've got people we can. I mean, we've got people that we can go to to pay them to do the prototyping. Okay. So that's that's where we're at on that. And uh, we we've, we've gotten a, a grant from the Kaufman Foundation. So we actually have like twenty six thousand dollars to get the <coughs> get the prototype of the steam engine up, and that should be enough cash for that. And then it's about evolving that to, to, to a really workable solution. Yeah. Um, those, those are uh, compressed bricks, or are they like masonry? You have to put concrete in between. Or the way you, you do can it, just wet them and yeah, you can actually wet them. If they're nice and straight. You can just wet the surface between them, and the the soil dissolves. And then once it dries, it binds the two two oh, courses. Yes, so okay. you can mm. you can lay them as soon as you press them. You don't mm -hmm. have to wait for them to cure. They can actually cure in the wall. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, the it, in principle, is extremely fast. And a machine that, that we made can produce up to 16 bricks per minute of, of the 2-inch bricks yeah. and probably about 10 of the, um, maybe 8 to 10 of the 6-inch full ones. And we haven't seen the efficiency of, of bricklaying because right now <laughs> it's, it's winter and the <laughs> bricks aren't in good shape. But what we did use, we found that we can use antifreeze as the slurry. So <laughs> we just sprayed it with antifreeze, sprayed between the courses with antifreeze, and we're able to lay. 
And if the bricks were a little uneven, we mix some slurry, mud slurry, yeah. with antifreeze. Because right now it's freezing where we are. <laughs> we're still building as we speak right now. And you talk about straw in between the walls, yeah. but uh, I know like hay bales will heat up. With, is there well, a they're totally with that? no. I mean, these are totally dried. These oh, are totally. like you know, a couple of percent of moisture in them. So yeah, they're totally you know they okay. when you touch them they they you know they dust up. I mean, they're yeah. they're very dry. So yeah, yeah. there's uh, a Companies overseas that make the compressor of blocks, yeah. but they're much more like Lego. Yeah. And they'll have a hole at the bottom, yeah. and they have protrusion at the top, mm -hmm. and they're just dry stacking those. I mean, they're doing three and four story buildings. Yeah. So yeah, that's a two point is. <coughs> I haven't thought about it that way. It's like let the community develop it. I would say. I mean, that, that is a totally different technology than what we're using in terms of the, the basic design. So it is a little different. There's a, a guy here in Dallas who's developed a machine that makes bricks out of uh, water bottles. Uh, oh, similar yeah. process, it compresses them to bricks and then you can build houses out of them. Huh. Uh, so just plastic waste? Plastic waste. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I had a question, you, you mentioned burning the biomass. Uh, how does the, uh, the pollution from that compare to burning gasoline? If you have a, a modern gasifier burner, then you can have a, a totally clean flame minus the nit nitrogen oxides because uh -huh. you're not com combusting at high pressure. So it's actually going to be cleaner. Cool. Yeah. Does anybody have experience in the type of environments that have a need for these sort of machines? Uh, we're starting to get there. For example, there's a guy in, in Guatemala who's actually another TED fellow who's who's building a village for displaced people, people who've lost homes for whatever weather extremities. So there's <coughs> that's going to be the looks like the first example. There's not. I mean, we're pretty young. I mean, these product releases are coming out just like <coughs> last year, so it's it's very early in the game. And it's about, like as I said in the video, it's we've got only like 100 or 200 hours of field testing on equipment. It's going to take thousands of hours for it to be generally adopted. And right now, what I typically do is when someone uh, overseas asks about the machine, it's like I tell them, look, the plans are there. You take them to your local fabricator. Just do it. It's going to be easier and, and more cost effective. So that's there's a couple of people starting that. There's, I think, a guy in, in like... Uh, down by Australia somewhere who's who's downloading the plans. There's people who are downloading the plans right now. We'll see what happens with the real rollout, but absolutely the, the implications for the developing world um, are huge. Mm -hmm. And for rebuilding economies here. Um, with your design, it's not, it's you're not trying to broaden the scope that it's it's not re from rebooting civilization to Having computers, it's rebooting civilization to survive and start working our way back. Like the end goal is not to say, and we also make PC wafer wafer fabs. It's we can go into just bare land in maybe a few years yeah. time, start yeah. where people can sustainably exist. That's a starting point, but you also notice that there is a lot of generative equipment here. This is you know precision CNC machining, a robotic industrial robot. Laser cutter, 3D printer, yeah. things like that. We're talking about once you have tools like that and the metal melting or extraction of aluminum from clay, you're talking about from that base, you can go back to any complexity of technology that you need, but starting with a technology base that's much more sound that hopefully brings on new social dynamics um, of distrib distributing wealth as opposed to concentrating it as, as today. So, mm -hmm. so it's a, yeah, sorry, so the, the idea is to. Uh, improve human society by uh, by going back to how we, we started producing what we have now? It's to generate appropriate modern technology, so we use the wisdom from before combined with modern technology, and the way I phrase it is is it's about, people always ask, well, this still doesn't address the fact that, you know, people are going to be people, and we're going to have the same problems afterwards. Well, my claim to that is, we are going to create a kernel which then sets a foundation for which the human evolution can take place. Because right now, basic material <laughs> scarcity is causing a lot of troubles on this planet, from resource conflicts to family feud <laughs> to mm -hmm. geopolitical <coughs> compromise. It's just about any problem that you can name is, if you think about it, it it's related to resources. Like, for example, what is government but, a, but an inefficient way to redistribute resources? So, so there's a lot of implications. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a sound technology base will put us on a different footing, 
And then, I, as I say, we, we have a hope to start evolving as humans. Have you thought of a business, uh, have you guys thought of the business side of this, for example, let's say you're in a developing country where, you know, tractors are all available, everything is available, but, you know, you don't necessarily have the money, but you have the land. Um, have you thought of the business infrastructure? How does the average farmer who perhaps doesn't have the education we do, but has some access to machine shops or people who do machining as such? Mm -hmm go about doing this? I mean, are there going to be businesses? Do you envision pe people whose business it is to make your open source tractor, sell it at, you know, half the price of their other tractor, etc.? I can tell you our experience right now. I mean, the que answer to your question is that there's, uh, this can seed all of that. Now, what we've done so far is take a look at the CV machine. It costs 4000 in materials. We sell it for 8 k or so. So, and we produce it in about a week of time. So, so you do sell it, you do, yeah. there is a so business aspect to this. Absolutely, so one of the fundamental features here is let's optimize the production such that it is economically significant. We're not talking about one-off devices, this is about optimizing the, the production process through open source means and publishing all of that. So we're talking about distributive enterprise. Which yeah, is a com that makes sense. Yes, mm -hmm. which is a combination of, of open hardware knowledge and open business plans where you actually document the ergonomics of production, everything that another person might need to start an enterprise producing that. Mm -hmm. Or producing products of that machine. How do you start a business constructing housing? Mm -hmm. So we've got, um, look at, go, go into the StarKit DVD one more time. For example, we're, we're producing plans of how to build housing using the compressed earth bricks. So go into, um, let's see, where's, um, go down more, go down to, just to show you what a house, self pulverizer, construction. Okay. Um, OSC micro house. We're working on it right now. We're getting the final architectural drawings. Uh, click on that blue. <coughs> So we're trying to show people everything. Like here, we're going to have a reed plant. <coughs> we're going to have the double wall CEB insulation, CEB floors. So we're going to document that, including the ergonomics of how fast that house went up. We have a workshop coming up this year. Where we're going to build one of these and document all of this. So that's a, that's a closed loop black water system. Nice. That's built in. Nice. Rainwater catchment. So highly ecological. That's very cool. With our sawmill, we can that's generate nice. our own lumber from the so from cool. the trees. We can generate our own insulation from mm -hmm. from straw. Down the road, the bioplastic extruder is part of the 50 technology. So take plants, convert them to greenhouse or house glazing. Mm -hmm. And down the road, smelt aluminum aluminum from clay or or steel from scrap. Could you tell us a bit more about the reed plant I had? Yeah, that's a uh, reed, the, what do you call, I forget what's, the reed plant, the kind of like the swamp plants, I don't know what you call them, what are they, the cattails. Uh, cattail, right. Cattails. Mm -hmm. They're basic, it's like, it's like a septic system, including plants, and we're actually considering putting in vermiposting in there, some worm beds mm -hmm. on top of that, where you're flushing a regular toilet, so it's like, doesn't freak out anybody, it passes code, and you're reusing your own water, that's purified back to... Uh, you don't want to drink it, but you can flush your toilet with it, let's say. Sure. And great water. That too. Say it again? Absorbing the nitrogen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, this, is, this I was just reading about that today on a, on a plane, and that thing is takes like, you know, like a hundred times, le no, a thousand times less energy than a conventional plant. Mm -hmm. It has better results and things like that. So, so basically, one of the claims that we make, and so it's common sense, is that for any technology that we have today, you can create a very benign, environmentally friendly, open source variant. So we always say that there is no material or energy issues that plague us. It's about how we do things and can we wake up to the opportunities mm -hmm. that exist. Um, with that, let me, let's show you, uh, I, I have a nice video, it's five, do we have five minutes? Sure. Let's look at the practical post-scarcity video because that kind of tells you uh, the ramifications of this, <coughs> kind of what we've been, practical post-scarcity go up all the way. Practical post scarcity. That's a good, good demonstration of the underlying message, social message. I love this one. That's.
a scarcity-based economy is the status quo of today because of the, the way human relations have evolved and not everybody is provided for. There's a lot of suffering going on. In the absolute abundance of resources, namely rocks, sunlight, plants, water, from which all the wealth of the economy comes. Their distribution to humans is, is very much corrupted and, and there's material deprivation going on on all these fronts such that people are hungry or in poverty, resource conflicts exist and so forth. So post-scarcity would be where we're connected more closely to the natural resources from where all the wealth comes by the fact that we have the means, the tools to to transform those resources into the feedstocks of modern civilization. Open source ecology refers to the integration of human and natural ecosystems along the lines of open source principles. When we say open source, that means open collaboration, open sharing of development and ultimately of economically significant information. We're developing the Global Village Construction Set as a means to show that one, we can create a real community based on these technologies and achieve post-scarcity. The Global Village Construction Set is a set of 50 different industrial machines that allow for the easy fabrication of all the different products that it takes to create a small civilization with modern comforts. Everything from a tractor to a, an oven to a circuit maker. Tractors being such a fundamental device, uh, access to them should be easy to, to make survival simple. So we've decided to build out of necessity because our tractors, industrial tractors that we bought kept on breaking, we built our own to first do construction, in fact, and to do basic agriculture in, in the experiment of trying to recreate civilization from scratch. So we decided to build the most simple possible device, and to do that, you need a frame, and we decided to use an XYZ construction type of a frame with bolt together members and put on a power unit. Initially, we didn't do a removable power unit. We did hydraulics because they're versatile. And Soon it turned out, well, if we're going to have a power unit, why don't, why don't we design it such that it can be interchangeable using our hypermodularity concept? The power cube is a modular power source. It's an example of a power source that can be interchanged between various applications, as opposed to be firmly attached to one device, serving as a power source for one device. Its range of use is unlimited. The key to making it so versatile is that you're transmitting power from this power cube by means of hydraulics, which is hydraulic oil flowing in tubes, which therefore allows you to carry large amounts of power in a very flexible way by quick connect couplers that plug in from the power cube into the device that you're powering. Currently we're using petrochemical hydraulic fluid because that's the only thing that's available on the market. Now there also is available canola oil with additives as, an, as a biohydraulic fluid and that's something we can grow on the farm here with our combine and oil expression and have locally made hydraulic fluid combined with the local production of hydraulic motors and and modern steam engines you can have a total resilient infrastructure for producing power compressed earth brick presses. We call it the liberator, as in liberating you from the main cost in your life, which is housing. If you have one of these machines, you can make bricks, which in principle can suffice to build an entire house, including roofing and flooring. Compressed earth brick, to my knowledge, is the only technique that's, that's rapid construction, requires minimal equipment, and can get you both natural and industrial scale building. It's driven by hydraulic power from a power cube, so you can stand a power cube alone. The, the basic design of the machine is, is a compression frame, so you start with that frame, which basically is this part from here to there, and the rest is everything that supports that compression. So you've got the secondary cylinder that moves a drawer in and out to load soil. You've got a huge hopper that can be loaded with a, with a tractor. We are the only operation or only CEB pressing operation that does this, which means a device that pulverizes and loads the soil in one step. If you use double CEB walls with straw bales in between, that's a hybrid CEB straw bale construction. That to me could perhaps be the next, uh, the next generation of housing for humanity. Hab Lab, 10 living unit arrangement, double CB walls, 3,000 square feet, and straw bale roof and walls. This relates to the technology of the Global Village construction set in that there's a tractor, salt pulverizer, CB press, power cubes that are being used right now as we speak. 
there's another technology, the gasifier burner, that's going into this structure that's all all part of the technologies. Now you see in modern civilization we have run away, the technology base has totally run away. Instead of our lives being more based on leisure time where we can actually do things that are most meaningful and we can improve ourselves as people and learn to get along, we're struggling on basic resource scarcities. Our technology is so complicated it takes us so much time, so much energy to maintain it that you're back to the dog race. We're trying to see if that's changeable by reducing the technology to the most simple yet sufficient modular Lego-like people tech imaginable. Heroes on the, that, that whole page, that's, there's a bunch of good stuff. Right. So what do we do? Uh, you said one thing you needed was help with recruiting. Yeah. Uh, I belong to a group called Mars Society. Have you heard of them? Who's that? Mars Society. Mars Society. They pr advocate man to exploration of Mars at some point. Oh, yeah, but yeah, yeah. They really okay. are into uh, taking uh, this kind of stuff there. And uh, there's probably 200 plus NASA scientists in this club. And uh, I can um, be They're an advocate to just uh -huh. try and say, hey, you know, how's your NASA funding going this year? Oh, why don't you come and, you know, work on this too mm -hmm. and see what happens there. Are okay. they interested in kind of the whole self-sufficient infrastructure right. concept, a, a which lot is common to this and going to the moon? And right. I, s I saw their uh, presentation at a hotel here in Dallas yeah. about three months ago, and uh, maybe... Uh, 15% of the talks were related to uh, sustainable eco ecologies. Um, yeah. So, yes, is the answer. Uh, so, okay, anyway, well I'll I can help you in that way. Let's see if we can material materialize some of that. Okay, so here's my notebook, actually. Please sign in. This <laughs> is my uh, maker notebook. It's like number 20 or something. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. I keep these, make them myself with with uh, fence wire and all that. <laughs> but uh, please sign in and uh, <laughs> email, phone, interests. Like if, if you want to work on something, yeah, Excellent. I want to I want to get all your contacts, Good. follow up and all that. One question, you talked about smelting aluminum from clay. Oh, yeah. What are the plans you guys for doing that? Is that something that can be done with current off-the-shelf technology? Well, it's uh, been developed for lunar applications and that technology has been proven, demonstrated on, on a pilot plant scale. They never did end up doing that on the moon or other places for various reasons, but that technology is a fully closed loop cycle hydrofluoric acid leach process where there's about, it's a, it's a nasty thing, however it's closed loop, mm -hmm. so there's like 100 grams of it at one time in a plant that produces about about a uh, 2,000 pounds of aluminum per day. Okay, so, so that's not something we want to DIY necessarily. Well, uh, mm -hmm. DIY in what sense? Uh, there, as an open source, as in a technology that a community can adopt if they have the, the skills and people to do that. What we want to do with that is show that it's possible, see if that actually does work er ergonomically, practically. What are the considerations? What are the costs? It's a basic plant, you know, um, We'll see how, how we can do with that as, as a test case of demonstrating this, this Global Village construction set. Oh, so I have some brochures here. There's only, a, I guess, not enough for everybody, but I'll, I'll leave them right here okay. for Wait. people. Scan um, one of those in PDF on the website. Okay. So yeah, you could actually, you if you, you can uh, you download them, them, of course, okay. yeah, <laughs> from the website, from the <laughs> blog. What, why don't you so say a word or two about... On the website, there's a join button. Yeah. Why don't you just talk about the join button? As far for as a join, I mean, there's so many different ways to participate, but right now, <coughs> we're, we're trying to focus on on getting stuff done at Factory Farm because when we grab your attention there, you can't you can't escape. So it allows you for for very dedicated dedicated focus time. Um, that's the deepest way you can participate. Dedicated project visits. If you want to prototype some part of some machine or a whole machine come on over, you can fill out a dedicated project visit application. The standard way for anybody to get involved across the planet is, is take any of the 50 machines and there's m much to be done on each from basic research to conceptual diagrams to CAD to fabrication to actual prototyping. A lot of that information can be recorded on a wiki, like what is the design for this scalable inverter? If you've got electronics info, um, you can input to the wiki. And we're trying to do it by 
starting with systems engineering breakdown diagrams, trying to break each technology down to the smallest component that can be worked on. That's that's one part of the process to do. So uh, you can subscribe as a true fan if you want to give financial contributions. Right now, we have about 520 people who are paying subscribing for two years at a at a ten dollars per month. So that's getting us a budget of five thousand per month right there. We s encourage anybody to do that to, if you want to make a little financial contribution. There's the donations. Um, what else? What else do we have? Um, we are going to start. We, we do want to start what's what's called OSC Fellows. If you look at on the on the DVD, if you look at the OSC Enterprise Plan, you'll learn more about the fellows. But we're trying to get a program that's like TED Fellows or some other fellowship, where the explicit focus is people to dis to to develop and document a distributive enterprise business model based on one of the technologies. So the goal is to develop the technology and show what can be done with it in a practical way. So once again, going back to the distributive enterprise model, where the goal is enterprise replication to distribute wealth uh, across the world. Um, those are the main things, mm -hmm. main things of how to get involved. But right now, we're at the stage where we need a lot of subject matter experts, designers, prototypers, CAD people. And with the budget that we have, we can also pay people to do that on a contract basis. We're trying to get a lot of volunteers still. And these days we feel that the retired population, retired professionals, like from AARP or professional organizations, uh, we want to find mentors and advisors. Mm -hmm. Advisors, people who just provide technical information. Mentors, people who get involved more deeply, perhaps spend like one or two weeks actually working hands-on with people. Right. So. There's all these different areas. And, and then there's the other organizational <coughs> sides, like resource development. We've got a volunteer resource developer working with us right now. And there's an OS, OSC Luxembourg starting, where they're starting an organization explicitly to raise funds for this, to get, get this to finish by December 21st. Mm -hmm. So I think another area where we can get more people is amateur yeah. radio. We've got an amateur radio interest group here. Uh, several of us uh, passed our tests recently mm -hmm. and uh, I think we could tap that resource here too. There's a lot of retired mm -hmm. people. And you mentioned about speaking opportunities. Mm -hmm. uh, that could be a way to to get money into the operation as well, charging for the talks. Um, I've given several. I mean, that, that's always a thing that's out there. Um, I'm trying to basically st stick as much to the, the project management right now as possible though because the absolute focus is the prototypes. Before we go anywhere, we need this kernel mm -hmm. that can be deployed across the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think uh, I've heard before tonight's or today's meeting yeah. whether yeah. there was a group here interested in the pelletizer. I think there's a couple other things that people have been talking about. I would be happy to be kind of a focal point if mm -hmm. people want to mm -hmm. start emailing me and telling me. I vote for this, I vote for that, I'll count these votes and uh, yeah, so the group write about that, that down, okay. make a note okay. by your name about right. that. Mm -hmm. um, so how do how does uh, anybody here feel about like inverter or induction furnace power supply? Because an induction furnace power supply is in a form of an inverter, uh, one type of an inverter. In my particular uh, locations, locations, I work for a large company and there's restrictions on uh, intellectual property and things. So I'm going to have to be not a contributor in that in, in that area and technically. You're, that works with, you're working with in that area? <coughs> the company is. I'm not on a project that does, but uh, the company does. Mm. The, the company so rule precludes, precludes him from doing that. But there right. are other people here that, that know right. about these kind of technologies to help. Mm -hmm. Right. So right. right. Yeah. So, so right. So I'm thinking that somebody else here would be the technical lead and I would be mm -hmm. the more working people side of the problems. and making uh, communication happen and things like that. Yeah. yeah. So an induction furnace is something that could definitely be useful here. That's yeah. 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 Melting metal. <laughs> I mean, induction <laughs> <laughs> furnaces are so cool. Yeah. We have a forge, but yeah. we have a stack of metal. Yeah, Has anyone thought about induction furnaces here? or? Not we haven't. Thing. Yeah, we we haven't had anybody uh, working on a project like that. But mm -hmm. I, I know there's at least two or three people here that would definitely be interested. Uh, uh, our uh, illustrious uh, uh, financial yeah. advisor uh, comes to mind. Uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, he but, uh, a blacksmith or something. He, he <laughs> does something with metal. <laughs> does, you know, yeah. Um, 
But uh, I, I think that's a, I think that's a good place to start. So we want to go ahead and one. we want to go ahead and start taking uh, just votes on uh, what projects people want to work on. Mm -hmm. Whatever gets the most, we maybe decide to help. And you know, it might actually be useful to throw your list of the 50 machines uh, on the screen because I don't think sure. most of us have looked at the, the yeah, detail. Yeah, go to. Okay, uh, I don't want to blind you there. Yeah, let's go through that really quickly. Is that there's go some to very interesting stuff there. Yeah, go to opensourceecology.org, or if you go to the main page, mm -hmm. okay. um, go to the opensourceecology.org. That's the kind of the static website. Yeah, so go to GVCS. Going through it will we'll generate some discussion. Yeah, so, sure. so there you go. So scroll down. From 3D Are printer. Are there, there discussions <laughs> on these machines? 3D scanner. Mm -hmm. On your in your wiki or in your forums or yeah, there's uh, each each machine pretty much has a page with like research on it and if there's work being done, there's information on that okay. and things like that. But I mean, most of it there's so many gaps. I mean, so are you are yeah. you looking to organically produce things specifically through the OSE project or are you look, uh, open exactly. to, of course? Adopting existing open source implementations. No, like absolutely. I mean, take any existing open source implementation as a start, and then pass it through the OSC specifications filter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So basically, awesome. modularity, design for lifetime, design for disassembly, just absolute simplicity, things like that that make it make it highly replicable. So I mean, the, a lot of the trouble with a lot of different, well, I mean. DIY movement, a lot of that is one-off type of stuff, but it's the next story to make it highly replicable. Mm -hmm. Tell us a bit more about the plastic extruder and the 3D printer scanner. Yeah, we'll back that way. yeah. Sure. 3D printer is like RepRap, so we, we want to get a robust mm -hmm. 3D printing device for doing things like uh, plastic parts or like electronics insulators, hard to find fittings and things like that. I think yeah. an important thing that makes that practical is extruding existing plastics, like being able yeah. to recycle bottles and stuff. Yeah. Because if you're looking at slums and stuff, like in India, they mm -hmm. they they made those the lights out of water bottles. It's like yeah. they, I mean, there are there are, there's junk all over the place. Yeah. And making that junk yeah. into new things is reuse. Yeah, be making that practical. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's. Yeah. How about the scanner? Is there something that On you guys scanner? are looking for, like an existing open source scanner, or is there if it has the performance to 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 do to scan things efficiently? I mean, the goal, the need is taking any object, like if we have to reverse engineering engineer something, a part, like or even a part in the GVCS itself. Say say the DVD got burned, but you still have. <laughs> Say you lost all the civilization starter kit DVDs, but you had your scanner. You can regenerate the blueprints from it by scanning the existing <laughs> objects. Sure. That's the gen general concept. Right now, it's you can reverse engineer a lot of different parts, like a gear. You can 3D scan and then CNC mill, for example. So that's so not something high precision. Not necessarily. Yeah. Look, we can scan something and get some sort of point cloud, but no, you want to make it. We can mill this and plug it into our tractor. Yeah, we have yeah. a project here that, that uses yeah. a general purpose controller, a machine controller, to control a bunch of different machines. Yeah, you know, that, um, like for example, a torch table, things like that. Yeah, that's something you, you know we could do relatively easy off the general purpose controller. And what what are you using there? Is it an open source version, or are you just using uh, yeah. some controller off shelf? I mean, the software is open source. The controller is is like it's, um, it's, it's, it's we call it our CNC cart. It's basically just. Uh, he, you plug he, it in any he got a chance to see it out there. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. I got a chance to see it. And what's inside of it is—is is it like below below loop drivers or what are the drivers? I forget. Who, who made those? Do we have gecko drivers? I think it's gecko. gecko, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. So on that project, so we're right now where we're trying to get an open source version of the gecko. I mean, that's you know like what like 180 bucks or something. Mm -hmm. So for you know for 40 bucks you can make your own on your own CNC circuit mill. You know things like that. So all these things fit together in some way. Like I didn't talk a lot about the product ecologies, but they're they're clearly there. Like take scrap steel, melt it down, precision machine it, and you've got a tractor. You know, thing. or you know, ro hot rolling. Uh, hot rolling is part of the the equation here. Um, one yeah. one quick question. Um, it, you don't have to back out to, but you had the picture of all of the objects. I'm yeah. assuming the wind turbine and the general purpose yeah, motor are highly correlated. Yeah, absolutely. So, for example, in, uh, let's take a look at the turbine. Take scrap steel, you can make your structure of it. Inside is going to be your 
your electric motor slash generator, so that's going to be that function. You're going to have to have a powerful power electronics controller, charge controller, or whatever power handling that or control that you'll need with this. So there's there's the universal power supply. That's that's our that's the device with all those different stackable electronics functions. So there's those three immediately come to mind. You're going to have maybe the machining of the gears in there if you're building this yourself. <coughs> it's basically uh, the entire tool set to build just about anything. Uh, but yeah, a lot of different things. You, there might be a few plastic parts from the 3D printer in there, insulators or circuits from the CNC circuit mill, maybe some laser cut or plasma torch cut parts or whichever. So um, yeah. So why the nickel iron batteries? Those are rechargeable? Yeah, well, those are, that. people say I've heard it being called the only sustainable battery out there by virtue of its hundred year or so lifetime. This thing you can you can discharge and charge really fast, and it doesn't it doesn't degrade like like nickel like for example lead acid batteries they last maybe ten years people say mm -hmm. or so but they're a bit less so efficient right say what they're long lasting but a bit less efficient than chargers actually they, they are yeah they're, they're power a bit less than most batteries mm -hmm. they're half as half the power density but for s for stationary applications or tractors and bulldozers that may be may be an excellent solution. Mm -hmm. um, if you talk about power infrastructure for society, there may be, like, we're off-grid, for example, so we, we need that. That would be a great thing to have to run our welders and things. Um, and in the rest of society, yeah, power storage, wherever that's that's applicable. Yeah, they're not as power dense. That's true. But you, you would but say that an example of a, of a uh, uh, bulldozer, mm -hmm. <coughs> rather than just adding dead weight mm -hmm. to the vehicle, if the dead weight was the battery to yep. run the vehicle, yep. it's no longer dead weight. But you have to have mass yep. to push mass. Yep. yep. So that would be an excellent application that, that would work. And you can get a few hours of good work time out of that battery weight. Yeah. Uh, do we want to look at the whole, maybe pull up the whole, whole 50 at a time we can, um, let's see, where, where do we see it? Go to the... If you go to the, let's see, what's the best place that has it? Go to the practical post scarcity. There was a, a few of those in there. Um, maybe that thing. Yeah, yeah, let's see. No, let's, yeah, let's click on that maybe. Uh, well, here's uh, that's not. Well, here are all the icons <laughs> below. But um, yeah, if you look at maybe this yeah, one, that's, that's the TED talk right there. Yeah, Global Village coming. Construction Set in two minutes has it. So, so play that um, and stop at the slide. If you haven't seen this, that's like the intro video. Open Source Ecology is a network of farmers, engineers, and supporters that for the last two years have been building the Global Village Construction like Set. Let's see, no, that's just a fraction of that. Let's see. We set the, the 40 story. different machines that it takes. To create a small civilization with modern day comforts. The Global Village construction set is like a life size Lego set in which motors, parts, and power units can interchange. Thus far, we have prototyped eight of the 40 machines and have published all of the 3D designs, yeah, schematics, instructional go to videos, the, and but the, uh, the words from Go to the TED talk, actually. That's a. You know, that's a if you go. Yeah, so those, that's a single graph of all of that. So, okay, that's like, that there is metal rolling, 
That's wire and rod mill. Uh, metal rolling, induction furnace. Where's that induction furnace right there? Huge. I mean, if we could, that's like metal. This is modern, modern civilization. After that is silicon. We don't really have too much on silicon here, but but the modern civilization comes from that. Um, gasifier burner to power your uh, <coughs> modern steam engine, wherever that is, from local biomass. Solar concentrator um, from the sun. I mean, the sun gets you four megawatts of power per acre. And we can trap that with 10% efficiency using solar concentrator. So you're talking about 400 kilowatts per acre. I mean, people say we've got shortages of that, but if you reduce the cost of that, I mean, that's my ultimate claim. It's like, if you open source it, thereby reducing it by several factors in cost, it becomes a feasible technology. It's just a question of cost. So, um, big one, big one. Wind turbine, 3D printer, uh, modern steam engine. Well drilling rig for water, laser cutter, industrial robot, inverter. Actually, an inverter is a separate item from the universal power supply, which is, um, I don't even see it. Um, but yeah, like a plasma cutter or welder power supplies, laser cutter power supplies, that's a big element. Which which do we want to go through? There's things like a car in the truck. <laughs> Everybody wants a car in a truck. <laughs> and we're actually thinking about a prototype. So a prototype that would use the power cube as its drive source with hydraulic motors. So a very flexible transmission system. Mm -hmm. They have made these industrially too. So this is nothing. None of this is new mm -hmm. at all. Um, truck. There's a uh, Mobius Motors. A tr uh, car like a Jeep for Africa. There's a company doing that. Mm. Uh, very simple design made of tubing for the frame. Hey, that's an excellent, that's kind of the model we want to go, just a super simple basic car, truck uh, that also can, can be powered by pelletized biomass, once again. Uh, How many prototypes do you have built? Uh, or is this all these are in design right now? There's, uh, there's eight Eight. About ten by now that have been prototyped. What about the well drilling? Uh, we that? don't have that yet. That's that's a big one. That's definitely a high cost for anyone starting up a household or, or a farm or whatever. Um, bulldozer. Oh, that's not really a bulldozer, but that's a symbol for a bulldozer <laughs> to to do your earthworks, ponds, preparation for a building, and all <coughs> of that. That's that's a big one. So right now, on a bulldozer. The plan is to basically scale up the frame, the basically similar design as live track, scale up the frame to six by six inch tubing, weigh it down to about twenty thousand pound weight, gear down the same motors, same same kind of concept that we have right now, gear it down by a factor of six, and then you've got about twenty four thousand pounds of pushing force. Right now in live track we've got four thousand pounds of pushing force on it. So that's, that's exciting. But you imagine if you use the same technology, just scale it to make it super simple still without getting into this, these planetary gear drives and tracks. We're, we're actually looking at using metal wheels that would um, be like traction engines from like 100 years ago that, that plowed the pra prairies. But those things could pull like 13 bottom plows and things. So those things were huge. So that technology works. It would be a much simpler way. We're going to explore that. Does that actually work for a lifetime design bulldozer? Because I know on a bulldozer you have to replace the tracks every like five or so years, for example. So uh, when we keep the life, lifetime design in there, that gives different design parameters. Yeah. Um, little micro tractor, walk behind tractor. That's a symbol for the CNC multi machine. Once again, that the concept of the construction set for precision machining. That's that's what we'll do to truly liberate that technology. Um, what else? Yeah, iron worker machine, combine, baler, bakery oven, <laughs> things like that. Um, any questions? Any particular questions on this about the list of, list of items? Yep. Uh, have you have you done a search for things like this that have lost their intellectual copyright yeah, yeah, protection I mean, or? Yeah, like for example, on the 
iron worker machine. We just looked at some of the patents. Yeah, you, cool. you do want to do do patent search from things that are older, and there's a lot of wealth, lots of wealth of info out there. I saw someone Many got things. some designs for a concrete lathe. Yeah, and that was that's another open source thing. It's pretty cool. Yep, yep, the multi machine, and we're trying to build upon that project and make it actually highly replicable. I don't think. Uh, to, to my knowledge, not a single one has been built for the concrete version. The la latest I checked was that there a few people are making them right now. But yeah, there's there's lots of potential, by all means. In the concrete concept, we have a huge bed of concrete, and then you attach your precision elements to that. Yeah, that's that's sound. That's totally sound. That's a historically proven, proven concept. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The wind... Turbine. Wind turbine doesn't doesn't have a copyright now. Well, we'll because that's very I mean, new. there's there's a hundred ways to do it. I mean, there might be parts okay. of it that you know, a particular company might have a particular route to do it. There's always like so many ways. That's why a lot of times I'm not concerned about oh, you're going to run into trouble because there's just a lot of ways to do things. <coughs> yeah. And that that turbine that you're talking about, how tall? Would it, it would be like uh, like 150 feet or so. 150. Yeah, I mean, talking about 50 kilowatts, so, yeah, it's going to be a, like 100, two, between 100 and 200. So that would, that would power up about five or six houses? Or? Yeah, 50 kilowatts, yeah, if you, depending on what kind of duty, I mean, whatever percentage How big duty factor, right? <laughs> yeah, you can assume maybe like where we are, the, there's actually some wind, wind power plants down by where we are, which, which generate 40% of their rate of power. So if you take, say, 20 less favorable sites, 20% of 50 is still like 12 kilowatts. <laughs> if that's on average, then you then that's an average household that uses a kilowatt, so that's like 12 homes. I imagine you're going to have some sort of power storage system. That would have to be there, and that's that's potentially the batteries. Or is there batteries. flywheels for that at all, or is that not necessarily efficient for... Um, that's one way to do it. I think it's more costly than other items. Are probably more if you have a supply of solar thermal storage, storage is a potential. Is it, what, is it called a gravity battery or whatever? Sure. If you have a supply of water, you pump yeah, it up to a higher level. Yeah, that's one way. I mean, to me, the simplest route is when plants grow and you harvest them as biomass <coughs> and burn it. That's one easy kill for stored energy, <laughs> just like we have all the petrochemicals that were derived from that same uh, process. Yeah, there's, there's much shorter, shorter when you get that, okay? Much shorter cycle this way. Yeah, yeah. And you can do it 100% closed loop cycle where you, you spread the, any of the nutrients that you burned up back to the fields or whatever. Um, about how much would, would, would it cost to build the uh, brick? Uh, the brick press? Pad? Yes. Yeah, it's 4,000 of materials, including the electronic controls. 4,000? Yeah. Yeah. And that's ready to go. Yeah, there you go. Power, power I mean, that's, well, that has an external power unit, the power cube. So the power cube. Yeah, so, so that's, that's an external thing. So we're not including that price in the 4,000 material cost. Yeah. How much is power storage in case? Uh, right um, now, cost wise, it's yeah. running about $2,200. I'll say what, I'll go ahead and write it. Yeah. Yes, but that's just materials. Well, that's just materials, yeah. And you go ahead and change it. It failed to change because we in the Where's the farm located? We're in the Kansas City area of Missouri. <coughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm really interested in that. Yeah. I'll go ahead and slide this in. Yeah. It's a good one. Oh, I'm going to come back tonight. Okay. See. Yeah, so <laughs> I think, yeah, thank you for having me here. Thank you. And hopefully we can uh, work together. <laughs> Forget these working stiffs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I can hang out all day. <laughs> but you, you guys have a drive, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, got, we got a little bit more of a little trip. Well, hopefully we'll be able to get back to you guys here soon uh, yeah. once we've got some ideas yeah. on, like, uh, who wants to work on what? Uh, so can you can you like uh, like so do you have regular meetings where you can tonight? actually work? Yeah, or tonight. do you have to do one tonight at about seven o'clock? Uh, well, so would you like if you make it a project? Can you commit to actually having like that that time dedicated to that's work? That's going to have to be discussed, uh, you know, with with the membership as a whole. Uh -huh. um, what will more than likely happen mm -hmm. would be like a like a smaller group. Uh, yeah.